excuse me, you know I'm struggling with recovering from uh, some kind of bug that's going around, but uh, I do want to assure you I don't think it's contagious anymore. It's about 10 days old, but appreciate your prayers in that regard. Now, we turn our attention to the preaching of God's Word, and as a preface, we shall open our Bibles it's my custom to read from both Testaments, to, and I do that on purpose, brothers and sisters. We'll turn to Deuteronomy 13, but I do that in order to show us the connection between the two covenants, the New Testament and the Old. I think that's such a vital, so vitally important in this day when so many Christians seem to think that the Old Testament is okay for Bible stories and that kind of thing, but really doesn't have a whole lot to do with us today in the 21st century And so I I hope that you'll see that some of the themes uh, from the Old Testament, there is that continuity between the two, and we'll see that today. As we turn to Deuteronomy 13, it's somewhat of a foreboding passage. It speaks of how the people of God were to deal with false prophets, and that is a theme carried on in 1 John 2 as well. So... We begin reading at at Deuteronomy 13.5, just a few verses here. But that prophet, 13.5, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you, or far or off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. But you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear and not again do such wickedness as this among you. Now as we turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2, we'll pick up reading where we left off this morning in our sermon text, and you'll see in verses 18 and following this same kind of tough language about those who would turn uh, God's people away from the Christ of the Scriptures. 1 John chapter 2, we begin at verse 15 for context. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now here's our sermon text. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things." I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's our text. We continue. Therefore, Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, and you also will abide, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us eternal life. 
That's God's word for God's people. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we embark upon a new year tomorrow, or I suppose to be precise, at 12.01 this evening, we can be certain that there will be renewed opposition by antichrists. Not the antichrist, but I say it in the plural, antichrists with an S on the end. I say this because we are reminded that we have been reminded perhaps over and over again this year that this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation under Martin Luther's began in 1517. And we uh, in the Reformed community have called God's people to a renewed opposition to those who are against Christ. That's simply what the word antichrist means. And they are many and they are Uh, flexing their ecclesiastical muscle, we might say, uh, and that the church is not immune from their attacks. But here in this particular passage, you've noticed that I skipped 15 through 17, and that's simply because I'm only with you these two times, once in the morning and once in the evening. Normally when I preach expositionally, I would go through verse by verse. But in this case, since I'm not going to be with you other than this evening, I wanted to jump in the morning. I wanted to present to you the blessings, some of the blessings that flow to us as those who are in Christ. Looking back over the blessings that have come to us over the past 12 months, we might say. And then this evening, looking ahead to steal us, as it were, to, to enerve us for certain opposition that is ahead for all true Christians. And it is ramping up even in our own country, sad to say. We were talking, some of us this, evening, this morning after worship, while we were waiting for the meal, and we were talking about the fact that it is an amazing time to be alive in the kingdom of Christ in the sense that places like China now apparently have more Christians than the United States. And that, that's a first in history. There was a time when there were, the Christians in China were few and far between and the Christians in America were everywhere. But now the tables have turned. And part of that is this very thing that we're talking about here the power and influence of antichrist, those who are against Christ, even, sad to say, in some of the pulpits in our land and in the world. So, as we come to this passage then, what we want to see, though, this isn't, uh, uh, this, the language here, of course, is very somber and sobering, to be sure, but at the same time, I want you to notice the gospel here. That in the midst of these strong warnings about those who would, are against Christ, and, and we need to be warned, in the midst of that is the gospel. This great contrast is set before us here in these few verses, in verses 18 through 23. On the one hand, we have those who are anointed by Christ, you and I, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have been anointed by him to be prophets and priests and king. On the other hand, we have those who are called antichrists. And there is this great contrast set before us. And it's fleshed out in four ways here in this passage. First, they are antichrists. And I'd encourage you to look at your outline if you have it with you. They are antichrists, but you are for Christ. All by grace, of course. They went out, but by grace you will remain. They believe lies, but you, by the grace of God, know the truth. They deny the Son, but you, by God's grace, acknowledge Him. And so this stark contrast is set here before us. And that positive side, of course, is a a, uh, result of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ at work in us. Let's look at those one at a time. This contrast, Christ anointed, contrasted with Antichrist. First then, they are Antichrist, but you, by the grace of God, are for Christ. 18, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is 
the last hour. John Calvin, writing about this passage, sums it up this way. The faithful here are confirmed over against disturbing offenses of Antichrist. There's that contrast. Here are these disturbing offenses of, of those who are against Christ, set in stark contrast to the faithful being confirmed in their faith. Jesus himself predicted this very thing, the harassment of the church by Antichrist generation after generation, century after century. He said it, for example, in Matthew 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. And so, even down to this 21st century, 2018 will be no different in this one sense. There are too many preachers, too many teachers in churches in our state and in our country who are anti-Christ, and this is the kind of Christ that they proclaim, and this is why it can be so bold as to use that kind of harsh language. They proclaim, you will find in pulpits around, around us, People who are proclaiming a Christ who is not truly God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. A Christ who was not conceived by the Holy Spirit or born of the Virgin Mary. A Christ who never performed a miracle. A Christ who did not rise from the dead. A Christ who is not the only mediator of God's elect, but co-mediator with Mary and the saints. A Christ who is not a complete Savior because we need to supplement His work with our own. A Christ whose main purpose was simply to teach us to love one another. A Christ whose main purpose was to liberate the oppressed of the world. A Christ whose main purpose was to help the poor and needy. These are some of the Christ that the false Christ that are being proclaimed to the people of God in our time. But none of these, as you well know, brothers and sisters, none of these are the Christ of the Scriptures. If you scan down a little bit to chapter 4, verse 2, you'll read this. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. And of course, John was writing that almost 2,000 years ago. Dr. Venema, in his book, The Promise of the Future, writes this about this, these warnings about Antichrist. Quote, the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to warn the church to be on guard for those who would speak against the Bible's teaching about the person and work of Christ. The doctrine, the doctrine of Christology of the person and work of Jesus Christ is under attack in Christian churches today. Make no mistake about it. Well, that's the bad news. But the good news is that they are antichrist, but the great contrast is that you are for Christ. They are against him. You, by the grace of God, brothers and sisters, are for him. Antichrists are certainly, God could wipe them out and destroy them and take them out. We read about that in the Old Testament, didn't we? How the people of God were actually to physically take stones against such people and stone them to death. God could certainly destroy all the Antichrists with a, with a word. But he allows them to, to be around as one means of him testing and strengthening his church educating us in discerning, uh, in discernment, causing us to dig into our Bibles and know what the Scriptures teach about Jesus Christ and to know what they do not teach about Him. We know the language here of we know it is the last hour. The word the is not in the original. It could be translated. We know it is a last hour. It's one of those high points in the history of redemption where uh, perhaps another one might be just before Jesus returns. We know that it, the time is short between the now and the coming of the Lord, whatever that means, however many years that means down the road. But um, we know that's true because among other things, 
we know that Antichrist will be defeated by the Christ and he will defend his sheep. He always has and he always will. Jesus said so in Matthew 16. I say to you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and you know the rest. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Yes, the Antichrists are against Christ and against his people. But the Christ will not allow the gates of hell to prevail against his church. Jesus said also in Matthew 24, Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And he reminded us in that same passage that false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But in that little phrase, if possible, is our hope. That God's elect will not be deceived by Antichrist. And we'll say more about that later. The point is here that, yes, they are against Christ. But you, by God's grace, are for Christ. For one thing, you know he is coming again. You know that he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Yes, it's true that antichrists have disturbed the church of Christ for 20 centuries almost now. But let the faithful, brothers and sisters, be strengthened against pessimism and be awakened, reformed, rather than discouraged. If Christ's advent was near, if it was a last hour some 19 plus centuries ago when John penned these words, how much more today? Let Satan's attacks simply remind us and the presence of Antichrist simply remind us that our redemption draws near. Even as Peter wrote by inspiration, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's purposes for his church in Christ cannot be frustrated by Antichrist or anyone else. In fact, we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. No, it is not for us now under the new covenant to pick up stones and go hunt antichrists and put them, stone them to death. The Lord will take care of that. Vengeance is his and he will repay. And yes, it is a sad thing that some such Wolves do creep in in sheep's clothing into the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we properly sing sometimes, by schisms the church is rent asunder. By heresies she is sometimes distressed. There are those that hate her. There are false sons in her pale. But against or foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail by God's grace. That's the first thing. They are antichrists. That's the first part of the contrast. They are antichrists, but you, by God's grace, are for Christ and shall remain so, true Christian. Then the second thing is that they, the antichrists, went out from the church, but you will remain by God's grace. Verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So the Holy Spirit now in this verse reminds us 
that even though in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I speak of, to use the language of Westminster, the Westminster, the church visible, that church which we can see worldwide, consisting of many denominations, in that church there are sometimes sheep and wolves closing, there are uh, antichrists who are sometimes church members, sometimes are even pastors, yet they are not true Christians. Otherwise, they would have remained in faithful Orthodox churches. They always, uh, when, whenever they are dealt with biblically, they are not stoned to death, but they are excommunicated. They are pushed out of faithful biblical Orthodox churches and find their homes in unorthodox churches. In fact, the Westminster Confession of Faith says in chapter 25 about the church this, in section 4, particular churches which are members thereof are more or less pure according to as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced. Ordinances administered and public worship performed more or less pure, purely in them. The purest churches, section 5, under heaven, are subject to both mixture and air. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan, end quote. That's harsh language, isn't it? But that's true language. That's exactly what the Apostle John is saying here. There are churches, if we should travel in California, we could find plenty of churches that have the name church in their sign, that are no churches of Christ, but they are actually synagogues of Satan. So, so called because they do not proclaim the Christ of the scriptures. In fact, they are against, as, as I pointed out earlier, some of the doctrines that are preached, the heresies that are preached Christologically are prevalent there. Jesus told us about this in another way, and that was through one of his parables, and you may remember it. Remember the parable of the farmer who went to bed one night and an enemy came and sowed what the Bible calls tares in his field. And these tares, it was, it was a type of seed, a type of plant that would grow up and it looked just like wheat, but it was not. It was a weed. His servants come to him in Matthew 13, 27, and they say to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Just pause there for a minute because some of us might wonder the same thing. If God is omnipotent, if Christ is the King of Kings, why would He allow the tares to be sown in the first place? But of course, it's not for us to question His great wisdom and providence. One of the reasons, as we mentioned before, is to strengthen His people. If there were no enemies to fight, if there were no wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, we would perhaps become lazier than we are. We would not be diligent in terms of guarding the doctrines of Scripture, a doctrine, guarding the doctrine of Christ. That's one reason. In any case, they ask him, how does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. And just pause there for a moment and remember that in this, all that is going on here in this text, in the work of the Antichrist over the centuries, there's no doubt that there is the evil one is behind it and motivating them. Going on, the servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. There is another reason why the Lord does not remove them. To do so would be to destroy the, the sheep in his church. The answer, his answer in verse 30 is, Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. God will take care of it in his time and in his way. This doesn't excuse us from church discipline. It's only to say that the Lord will deal with it himself as well. Now, as we come in and we, we think about what's written here in verse 19 in these somber words, we recognize that those who permanently fall away from Christ, and I want to emphasize that word, permanently, those who permanently fall away from Christ, who leave the church of Christ permanently, 
only had what Hebrews 6 calls a taste of the heavenly gift. They never were regenerated. They never were born again by the sovereign grace of God in Christ. And that's a painful thing to see. And maybe you have even witnessed it. If you've been around in the church for longer than a decade or two, there is no doubt that you have seen such a thing or at least heard of it. The RCUS, my denomination, is not immune from it. Neither has the OPC been in her glorious history. It's a painful thing to see, but it's necessary. The head of the church uses this kind of trial to separate the wheat from the chaff within his church, to separate the sheep from the goats, to separate true shepherds from those that he calls a hireling in John 10. But there's good news here too, brothers and sisters, as well. Yes, uh, that is a sad thing to see, this, uh, those uh, that we thought, perhaps even in places of leadership, we thought that they were our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's sad to see them depart from us and to become evident that they were not a part of the body of Christ ever. If they had been of us, the scripture said, they would have continued with us. And in that little language, they would have continued with us is the gospel is a gospel promise that you, brothers and sisters, true Christians who truly belong to Christ, who are his sheep, will continue forever with Christ's sheep. This is not meant to frighten you, and it must not be used that way. You are of us, to use the language of the scripture here. You will, by the grace of God, continue with us, or to use the language of the creeds, persevere in the faith. And I don't just say that myself. Second Timothy 2 says, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are His. Jesus Himself said that He holds us in His hand and that He is in the Father's hand and that no one can pluck us out of His Father's hand. Your catechisms flesh this out very beautifully. In question 79 of the larger catechism, the question is asked, may not true believers fall away from the state of grace? And I'm abbreviating a little bit here for sake of time. The, the abbreviated answer is like this. True believers, by reason of the unchangeable love of God, their inseparable union with Christ and the Spirit and seed of God abiding in them can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This is not meant to frighten God's sheep. This is simply to say that uh, the flip side of this coin, as we pointed it out in the outline, is yes, they leave. Antichrists eventually either leave of their own accord or are driven out of Christ's church, but Christ's sheep will remain in it, and you can be confident of that. In fact, Calvin says it this way, quote, it is impossible that they should be separated from the church, for the seal which God's Spirit engraves on their hearts cannot be obliterated. The incorruptible seed which has struck roots cannot be pulled up or destroyed. We continue with the sheep of Christ's sheep because he has worked his grace in us. He, had, he has planted us and we cannot be uprooted. He has sealed us and that seal cannot be broken. Or to say it in the words of your larger catechism again and abbreviated question and answer 80, can true believers be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and that they shall persevere therein unto salvation? Answer in part, such as truly believe in Christ and endeavor to walk in all good conscience before him may, by faith, grounded upon the truth of God's promises and by the Spirit enabling them, be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and shall persevere therein unto salvation. That's that P in tulip, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But we don't get no credit for this, brothers and sisters. It's not because we persevere and they fall away. We stay and they leave because we are so much better than they. God forbid. It's only the sovereign grace in Christ alone as our 
as your catechism fleshes out, giving all the glory to God alone that makes the perseverance of the saints a reality for us. And that reality, that perseverance is certain. One more quote from the larger catechism in part 81. True believers are never left without such a presence and support of the Spirit of God as keeps them from sinking into utter despair. Well, that's the second thing in this great contrast. First, they are antichrist. You are for Christ. Second, they went out. By God's grace, you will remain. Third, they believe lies. You, by God's grace, Christian, know the truth. Verse 20. And now that which is implied in the previous verses now is crystal clear. You, believers, have an anointing from the Holy One, verse 20, and you know all things. This is good news, isn't it? This is gospel good news. All this is said not to rebuke, not to scold, as if you are ignorant of antichrists and their doctrines and their teachers. But this is a reminder of what you are and what you have been given in Christ Jesus. That by His grace, having redeemed you body and soul, purchased you to be His own, you are given the ability to discern between antichrists and true biblical Christology. Nevertheless, you need to be reminded, you and I need to be reminded of this duty to stay diligent, to stay vigilant, even as we come into another year when the enemy will not be asleep, you can be sure. Who makes us to differ in this way? Notice the language. It is not said that you have purchased an anointing or you have earned an anointing Simply, you have an anointing from the Holy One. This, you are passive in this. You have been given it. You have been given an anointing by the Holy One. And of course, our minds go back to the Old Testament, don't they? We think of the officers who were ordained, not by laying of hands like we do now, but by the pouring on of oil, the prophets, the priests, and the kings anointed. And the Apostle John is reminding us here under the influence of the Holy Spirit that you and I are anointed prophets, priests, and kings by Christ, by the Holy Spirit. What a great privilege this is. He goes on to say that because of this anointing, you know all things, and I realize that, and that you know the truth, and I realize there are some textual variants here which I won't get into. The point is that because of this anointing of the Holy Spirit, Christians, rather than being sucked into the the wake of the antichrist are given the ability by the spirit and word to spot lies and to acknowledge the truth think of the person who's trained uh, to spot counterfeit bills they study the original to such a degree that it, they can instantly spot a fake because they know the original so well that's the idea here that the Christian, especially the mature Christian, having studied the scriptures for years, having been under the instruction of the word, is given the ability through the anointing of the Holy Spirit to spot the lies of Antichrist and to acknowledge the truth of biblical Christology. Our catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, asks this question, why are you called a Christian? And part of the answer is, because by faith I am a member of Christ and thus a partaker of his anointing. And it goes on to flesh out how we as prophets speak the word of God, how we as priests offer ourselves as, as sacrifices of thanksgiving to him, how we as kings fight against the devil and the world and the flesh. So the apostle tells us that part of this anointing is knowledge. You know all things. And this language here is not meant to say that you know everything about everything. Obviously, that is not what the Apostle says. If anything, the Scripture makes us realize the longer that we walk with the Lord and the, the longer we study the Word, how little we know. But the point is that in comparison to the, con the, the Antichrists who know very little about the Christ, you know everything there is necessary to know about him, everything that God has revealed in his word. 
And so the exhortation comes then to use that knowledge. As those who are with great privilege comes great responsibility. Since you have been anointed as prophets, priests, and kings, then use that knowledge of all things concerning Christ these coming weeks to the glory of God, to the good of fellow Christians, reaching out to your neighbor with the good news of who Christ really is. Because there is great ignorance in our communities about who Christ is, isn't there? And so, verse 21 goes on to say, I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Think about it, Christian. Perhaps over a lifetime of sermons and catechizing and teaching and Bible study and Bible reading, and listening perhaps to various teachers on the radio, now on the internet. You have been immersed in the Scriptures and more and more coming to know the truth of the Scriptures. Coming to know it better and deeper year after year. Because Christ, this also is a gospel privilege and a gospel blessing. You know the truth by the grace of God. The Antichrists do not. They think they do. They promote, they say they do, but they do not. But you know it, and you also know a lie when you spot it, that no lie is of the truth. That's part of that anointing by the Holy Spirit, that discernment between truth and lie, especially in this context relating to the doctrine of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's a, there's a challenge here, brothers and sisters, but I especially speak to the younger generation, and I'm glad, so glad you are here. There's a challenge to the, the up-and-coming generation. Do not be weary in studying the truth, especially regarding the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Soon it will fall to the next generation to take up the challenge here that is in verses 18 through 23, to be diligent in promoting the biblical doctrine of the person and work of Christ and standing fast against all the heresies that are out there about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Discerning the light from the darkness. So that's the third contrast. Then comes the fourth and last. They, Antichrist, deny the Son, but you, by the grace of God, acknowledge Him. Verses 22 and 3. 22 reads this way, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. What makes a Christ denier a liar? He does not mean that only Christ deniers are liars and no, there is no other kind of lie. That's not his meaning. His meaning here is as if to say, who is a greater liar than the one who says that the Bible's description of Jesus is false? And by the way, we have those, they come knocking on your door from time to time in the, in the, under the rubric of a name of Jehovah's Witness. What a misnomer. Or under the name of Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They come to your door and they talk about a Jesus who is not the Jesus of the Scriptures. They talk about a Son of God, a Christ, who is not the Christ of Scripture. Who is a greater liar than the one who says that the Bible's description of Jesus is inaccurate? Anyone who denies the Jesus, the Christ, that is described in the Bible is an Antichrist. Not the Antichrist, but an Antichrist. Antichrist. He, is against, he or she is against Christ. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit describe the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in great detail in the Scriptures, don't they? In the New Testament especially, but even in the Old. And so to describe our Lord Jesus Christ in any other way than what we have in the Scriptures makes one an Antichrist. And that's one reason why we have creeds, catechisms, confessions, to help us lay that down and say, here is what we believe the Scriptures teach about the person and work of Christ, among other things. 
History is full of examples. I mentioned two in our modern times of those who promoted a Christ who is not the Christ of Scripture. And I mentioned previously some examples of the Christ that are presented in liberal pulpits the today. Calvin puts it this way. <clears throat> Christ is denied whenever those things which peculiarly belong to him are taken away from him. I'm going to say that again. Christ is denied when those things which peculiarly belong to him are taken away from him. Does the scripture teach that Christ is the God-man? Are there those who take that away from him, try to take that, those titles away from him? Then he is denied by them. Those who deny the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ are the worst of heretics. That's what John is saying here under the Holy Spirit. Verse 23. In fact, he goes so far as to say in 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. And you know what that means. If you don't have the Father, you're going to hell. You're talking here about damnable heresies. Not list, just little aberrations about whether you sprinkle or whether you immerse in baptism. Not small things like that. These are damnable heresies when you tamper with the person and work of Jesus Christ. The flip side is, as he goes on, he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let's delve into that. So stated negatively in this last verse, it is as if to say, deny the Son, you don't have the Father, and don't pretend that you do. Again, thinking about, for example, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. They claim to love the Father. But if they don't have, if they deny the person and work of the Son, the Apostle makes it crystal clear they do not have the Father either. The Father and the Son, after all, cannot be separated. They are one in essence, though two persons. Jesus himself said, I and my Father are one. Now, that's the negative. That's to state it negatively. Deny the Son, you don't have the Father. And we don't want to mince words with that when they come to our door, for example. Stated positively, since you acknowledge the Son, and this is the gospel good news again, since you, brothers and sisters, by God's grace, acknowledge the Son, you have the Father too. What does it mean to acknowledge the Son? Well, we could use the Nicene Creed for an example to say what it means to acknowledge the Son, something that people have confessed since the 4th century. What does it mean to acknowledge the Son? To say that you believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. To say that you believe that He was begotten of the Father before all worlds. worlds. To say that He is God of God and light of light. Very God of very God. And even as I proceed to say these words, you can, re, you can re recognize that these are not things that a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a liberal theologian would want to confess. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. You, to acknowledge the Father is to say that He for us men and our salvation came down from heaven, that He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, that He was made man. And if you confess these things about the Son, you have the Father too. James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary on this passage says, quote, The one who finds Christ finds the Father also, and both possesses and is possessed by Him. To have the Father is to have the Son. To have the Son is to have the Father. In fact, if you'll look over at John chapter 3, verse 1, here's that beautiful language fleshing out that very truth more fully in 3.1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Brothers and sisters, you, by sovereign grace, did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Father has you. Not only do you have the Father, but He has you. 
by God's grace. And that is said so beautifully in Revelation 14. When I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, Christ's anointed have been contrasted now with Antichrist. And by the sovereign grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, we see that by His grace you are for Christ, though they are against Him. You will remain in the church of Christ by His grace, though they go out. You know the truth by His grace, though they believe lies. You acknowledge Him, though they deny the Son. And may these wonderful truths about who and what you are in Christ and what, you, what lays ahead for you in 2018, that you will remain for Christ, that you will continue to know the truth, that you will continue to grow in the knowledge of the truth, that you will continue to acknowledge Him and the Father. May those thoughts be a source of great blessing to you in the time to come. Amen.